Hello, beautiful people. Welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah, and today I'm going to be doing the 54321 tarot tag from Kelly Bear. Um, this has been very popular, and I couldn't resist getting in on it, even though I don't do a ton of, of uh, tag responses these days. Um, I like this one that uh, Kelly Bear came up with because it's not just um, sort of a deck shopping excuse. It's got a little bit more introspection and meat to it, I think. Um, and so I appreciate that. So without too much preamble, let's get into it. So the five is five tarot decks. And uh, my understanding is that we can choose a group of five around any sort of theme or topic that we want. And I thought I would do mine on kind of a this for that theme. So decks that I have in sort of popular categories or instead of other decks that are very popular. And I'll start with a new to me deck. This is the Astrea Tarot. I just got it in last week. I'm just very excited about it. I found out about this on Tom Benjamin's channel originally. Um, this is by an artist who styles herself Ash La Astrea. I believe she's in France. She identifies as a queer person of color. And so it's nice to support um, someone in that way. This is a pop culture deck. Um, it is a traditional Marseille, or it's modeled on a tra traditional Marseille, but it has pop culture figures in it. And so we have people like Michael Jackson. Um, but I think it's really cool that she's done this, the way she's kind of put this together. She has historic figures, she has uh, modern figures, and obviously a lot of different kinds of representation. And I love the color palette. And I've been looking for a really kind of punchy, modern, recolored uh, Marseille sort of deck, you know, one that I can use to read for other people with. And I think this is, this is my, one of my favorites, or it's going to be, a, you know, become a favorite. Um, I love the color palette. I like uh, the choices that she made. I like that she put in more color. And she's, um, her heritage is from somewhere sort of more tropical. I'm not exactly sure where. Um, but that's reflected in some of the embellishments and suit symbols that she's chosen. So here we have what looks like a monstera plant or some kind of big broadleaf tropical plant here. And then the, the cowrie shell is the um, coins or stones or discs um, symbol. So this is really cool because it, it makes sense, right? The cowrie beads or cowrie shells were used as trade items. Um, among some uh, African and Caribbean uh, islands. And so this makes sense as like a currency, but it's also particular to um, some indigenous cultures. So that's the uh, Estrella Tarot, and it's my choice for a kind of pop culture Marseille deck, diverse Marseille deck that's, that's available now. Next, I want to talk about cartoon decks. And what I mean by cartoon decks is something that is modern and that has a hand-drawn art element and that sort of reflects um, either younger people to some degree or just modern culture in some way. Uh, and examples I'm thinking of to compare with would be something like the Cosmic Cycles Tarot, the This Might Hurt, the Sasori Bito would be would be things along those lines, even so, to some degree the Good Karma Tarot, although that is very, very youth-centered and sort of more of a teen deck, I would say. Um, but my choice in this category would be the Fifth Spirit Tarot. This is by Charlie Claire Burgess. Um, there is a second edition now available from Hay House, so it's, um, it's widely available and very uh, affordable. Um, the first edition was the indie version, and the cards look slightly different. I like this version, but that's just me. So what I like about this deck is that it does have that pop element or that modern element, like this person is dressed in, you know, they look like they're wearing maybe a costume or something, but they have modern like belt and pants and shoes on. Um, you know, you get, you get a hint at sort of traditional, but then, you know, she's wearing an evening gown and, uh, and cowboy boots or things like that, or stuff like this chariot card where this person, you know, is clearly in roller derby gear. 
So it's it's relatable. This one's really good for reading for other people, reading at markets and fairs, that kind of thing. Um, this is my choice for a, a pop culture, um, sort of modern, drawn type of um, artwork style deck. So another style of deck or category of deck that's very popular is animal decks. Um, and as I have mentioned on my channel before, I love animals. I have animals um, and I've had animals for a long time, but I don't tend to read tarot with animals because to me, it's hard to translate an animal's experience or reaction to certain situations to human um, experiences. But I do have an exception and that is Le Dinosaur de Marseille. Um, so another uh, pop culture uh, Marseille deck, but this one has dinosaurs in it. And they're kind of anthropomorphized a little bit, and I think that's part of what helps me. Like, the, the expressions seem very human. Like this um, queen of ammonites, for example, you know, she's kind of squinting and frowning. Um, so you can, you can imagine that on, on a human face, and I think that helps it translate. Also, just who doesn't fucking love dinosaurs, man? Like... It's great. I, I love that it's dinosaurs. I think it's hilarious, um, but it's also very quippy. It's very smart. Um, and the way that the uh, artist has linked up specific categories of dinosaur, like um, carnivores versus herbivores versus air, flying dinosaurs versus, you know, dinosaurs that live in the sea, it really works well with the suits. It really works well with it, even the major cards. Um, like the Tyrannosaurus Rex is the death card, for example. So, you know, of course, the Tyrannosaurus Rex was like one of the top predators. It eats uh, it eats other dinosaurs indiscriminately. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a perfect, a perfect match. So that is my choice for an animal deck. And it's the only deck that, that is based around the theme of particular animals um, that I have in my collection. So the Dinosaurs de Marseille. Dinosaur de Marseille, I should say in French, uh, and that's by Anastasia Cassian, and it's still available in print. The fourth, um, this for that I have is uh, something something along the lines of the Genasa Jaus or the Japaridze Tarot, or even something like the True Heart Intuitive Tarot. Um, all of those have an artist's touch, and they're all to some degree, I think. A bit introspective and a bit surreal and so to kind of fit that niche um, I have tried both of those other decks but they just didn't work for me but what does work for me is this tarot de carlotides um, and this is by another um, Spanish artist her name is Carlota Santos um, she's not credited on this deck anywhere so I actually wrote her name on the side of the box so I could remember it um, but this is a modern deck produced by Fournier, uh, so it's very much available. Um, it's, it's available from tarot arts and other places that sell imported decks. Um, again, you get lots of uh, good represent representation here, and you get a lot of stuff kind of packed with the symbolism. Um, so again, it's got a sense of humor, but it also has a lot of depth to it. It might look really straightforward at first, but then you start to notice little tiny details like there's eyeballs on the end of each of these strands coming off of this crown from the Ace of Swords. So, you know, and a heart down here, and this thing's been pulled up by its roots. So what what can you do with that, right? What can you do with that in a reading? Again, I love this deck because it blends all kinds of different, different stuff that we're aware of and puts its own twist on it and then gives you a lot of open space to interpret things. Um, and it's very much not a Marseille, and it's very much not an RWS. Um, even though a few cards lean to the RWS, a lot of it doesn't. So I like that about this deck because, you know, it just gives you something different uh, to look at and to work with. So that is the Tarot de Carlo Tides, a sort of modern art surrealist introspective kind of deck. And then the last deck I want to feature is the Blood Moon Tarot. Um, I also got this fairly recently in a trade a couple of months ago and I was very pleased to get it. Um, I had been holding out to see if the author um, would reprint, and Sam Gay uh, says that they are intending to do that, but their timeline seems to keep getting pushed back and pushed back. So I get that, you know, they're a one person kind of show and they don't just do tarot, they do a lot of, their main thing is artwork um, and prints and writing books and things. So, you know, they need to do whatever they need to do to kind of, support their their creative process um, but I do hope that they will reprint it 
Um, and this has a lot of really interesting organic humanoid shapes um, and a lot of almost horror kind of look, but like really beautiful in a way. Uh, there's tons of eyeballs in this deck, by the way. If you don't like eyeballs, you might want to skip ahead to the next section. But yeah, it's sort of the, the mad fairy tale world, uh, fantasy world. It reminds me a lot of the Marielle. And that would be one deck that I that I can't sort of get around or can't seem to connect with, um, where this deck I really do connect deeply with. So that would be one to compare it to. Um, for me, it compares very well to, to most of the kind of haunted, spooky storybook kind of decks, any of your fairy tale decks or anything based on kind of illustrated period where Duloc and... Oh gosh, who's the other one uh, I'm trying to think of? I can't think of their name, but I'll put it on the screen. Um, but that kind of thing, you know, uh, storybook illustrations or f uh, fables and folk tales. Um, it also calls to mind, like I said, the kind of uh, Geiger-esque, you know, bodies merging with plant life. Like this one here, you can see is the emperor and his arms are coming around here, but he has these like vines, you know, and is, it, is he wearing a tree? Is he part tree? Does he have, how many arms does he actually have? You know, that kind of thing. Also, I'm using gendered language here, but this is a very trans affirming deck to me, just the way that the figures are drawn. Um, a lot of them seem to be, you know, either non-binary or potentially trans. I definitely appreciate that aspect of it. And then the other uh, deck that I would compare this one to, or, or the, you know, where I have this one instead of the light seers, believe it or not, because I think some of these people are very beautiful and the colors are very rich and, and, and lovely. Um, but I don't relate to the light seers. It's, it's too Abercrombie and Fitch for me. It's a little too Coachella-y for me. I relate to this one much better. And, uh, another one that I might put along those lines would be the bone stone and earth flesh tarot, um, which again, kind of has that dark spooky fairy tale kind of a thing going on. Um, I almost feel like if the if the light seers and this deck had had a baby, it would be the bone stone. I'm not interested in, in ever owning a copy of that deck. So this is my, this is my alternative. This is my less messy, more accessible in terms of the visuals version of that. And I really enjoy it. It's gorgeous. Um, I do hope that Sam will reprint it maybe in a slightly better cardstock. This is that ultra stiff kind of deluxe cardstock with um, unnecessarily gilded edging and it's not my favorite. Um, so while I'm very pleased to own this, I would love to see, you know, a, maybe something on linen cardstock in a, cas a cas casino type of flexible card would be very nice. So that's the Blood Moon Tarot. So counting down, we're on to four and four tarot books. So I want to talk about a book that I no longer have in my possession because I gave my copy to a friend, but it was instrumental in getting me started in my tarot study, tarot exploration, um, and that's Rachel Pollock's Tarot Wisdom. It's a 30 years later follow-up to her very famous book, 78 Degrees of Wisdom, but it incorporates some tarot history that is not in included in the first book, and it compares cards and card meanings as given by various writers on tarot over time. So she shows you the Visconti cards, she shows you Rider Waite Smith, she shows you Marseille, you know, comparison uh, for each card. Um, and then she also gives you the meanings. So what did Count de Gablin say about it? What did um, Aleister Crowley say about it? What did Waite say about it? Uh, what did Atea say about it? And then what does Rachel Pollock think about it? And of course, she's had, you know, many, many years of experience at this point. Um, not only doing tarot readings and studying tarot herself, but also teaching classes and writing other books. And so she has a lot of depth behind her experience and how she writes about tarot. It's not really a tarot history book, but it is a comparative tarot exploration. And I think that's really helpful, especially for a beginner, to not get locked into assigned meanings of cards. She also does include spreads for each of the major cards. So there's a magician spread and a Wheel of Fortune spread, and a Judgment spread, and so on. Um, and those are kind of fun. Another tarot book, speaking of spreads, um, that I really have enjoyed, 
uh, using, and I haven't read this cover to cover yet. I will be doing a more thorough review of this um, this year as part of my Read Your Tarot Books on Your Shelf project. Um, but I really like this Power Tarot by Trish McGregor and Phyllis Vega. It does include more than 100 spreads that give specific answers to your most important questions. And what I love about this book is the speci specificity of those spreads. So this book is out of print, but you can certainly find it online. I just saw a copy. Um, I was curious to see if anyone were out there. I found one online that was $6.50 plus shipping. So even though this is out of print and has been out of print for a while, um, it's still quite available and uh, in the back it has that over 100 spreads. Uh, manifestation, pets, moving, a, a dis-ease spread about stress, a, stressed, uh, a spread to do on your birthday, a relationship spread. She has a shorter version of the Celtic cross in here. Uh, a spread for ex-lovers. Um, don't we all want to read on our exes? No, not really, but um, <laughs> a lot of people do. Um, and so this could also be good if you're if you're willing to work from a book and um, or or you know work up a competency with one of these ahead of a client meeting. If you knew that they wanted to ask about a specific topic, um, then you could certainly do that and find a spread in here that would help you address that specific question. So this is a very cool resource. The the only about a third of it is the spreads, so there's more, and I will again be reading more of this book and giving a more thorough review of it in the future. My third tarot book I wanted to revisit is the, the tarot book, The Origins, Meaning, and Uses of the Cards. This is technically a guidebook to the Sheridan Douglas Tarot, which was developed by these two men, but it is one of the most straightforward and comprehensive tarot books I've read. Um, it has a good, no-nonsense, no-bullshit history of tarot. It's got some nice illustrations of early tarot decks and a lot of citations to, you know, when tarot is mentioned throughout history and what the attitudes towards it was in the beginning. And then even if you're not using this particular deck, which I'm not anymore, the illustrations and the thought behind the specific cards is really cool and it just provides another point of view. And what I like about the way they write about tarot is that it just expands my mind and expands on some of the the sort of rehashed meanings of cards. For example, the Six of Cups. We have upright happiness built on past efforts, harmony, well-being, pleasant memories, and the realization of a dream. So that's different than nostalgia. Um, nostalgia doesn't really, it's not, I find that's not a, usually a useful interpretation. It doesn't really apply, you know, in uh, direct kinds of questions like what, you know, what's my next step on my spiritual path, or which job should I go for, or how can I work out this thing with my mother-in-law? If the Six of Cups comes up and you're like, nostalgia, to me that's not very helpful, right? But here, happiness built on past efforts, realization of a dream, things of the past bringing pleasure in the present, that, that's a little more helpful. New elements entering one's life which are linked in some strange ways with, with the past, that happens, you know, everything is connected. And working through the present, the past working through the present will create a future. So it's, it's ideas like this, you know, whether I totally understand or agree with all of them or not, um, they just help sort of make sense of a lot of these trite um, and repetitive keywords that are less helpful. Um, and there's lots of good spreads. Speaking of spreads, there's lots of good spreads in this book too. So again, um, the tarot, the origins, meaning, and uses of the cards by Alfred Douglas um, and the artwork illustrated by David Sheridan. Uh, this particular version of this was published by Penguin and I think it was published independently of the cards. So you can find used versions of this. This is obviously a used beat up copy. Uh, that I got offline for a very small amount of money. You can also get the modern revised version of this book from the family and it's sold uh, from the UK. Um, it just makes the shipping internationally a little bit expensive and I kind of wish they would do an ebook version of this. So it'd be really nice to just download this um, because the illustrations are, you know, they're nice but they're not totally necessary. If you have the deck you do and if you don't have the deck it's probably not for you anyway. But the writing is is what's really important and helpful. 
So um, that's the tarot. And then lastly, just a fun book that I did show a while back um, when I first received it as a gift. This is the tarot book published by the Library of Esoterica. Tosh and uh, Natalie, if you're watching this, this is uh, Tarot Navigators of the Mystic Sea on the, on the cover. Um, but this is really just a, a lovely coffee table book about um, all kinds of tarot decks. And for someone who appreciates both modern art tarots and also historical tarots, it's just a really cool thing to have. Um, there's all kinds of interesting examples and illustrations here from all different time periods and beautifully blown up imagery. And then just a little bit of writing here and there. So it really is, you know, sort of an art book um, with, with a small amount of information. It's certainly not one that's gonna teach you the tarot or whatever, but it can give you, again, some comparative artwork. And it's also a nice one if you don't have copies of certain decks, you can sort of look through and pick up on the imagery of the different cards. As you can see, it's organized like a tarot deck. So it just goes through the deck in order, and then it gives you um, examples of each of the cards from various decks and not always from the same decks. So kind of um, hand-picked or curated examples of each card and then sometimes a little essay or poem or whatever about that particular card and then in the back we have visionary exploration so you have more of a kind of a history and um, some cultural influences and and that kind of thing so a very cool book and it's still still available as far as I know, it's hefty. Um, if you have a tiny space, this may, may or may not be convenient to own, but um, I really like it. I, I think it's cool. And what I think is extra cool is that my partner got this for me and I had never seen it before. So that was an extra treat to, to open this up and be like, wow, I didn't know about this, but I love it. <laughs> All right, prompt number three is spreads. And I've already talked about spreads a lot. Funnily enough, I don't use spreads all the time. I often use um, just like a three card spread, you know, three cards or uh, a nine card open reading or something like that. But I'll talk about some spreads that I do like. Um, and the first one is one that I adapted and developed for my own card of the year kind of readings. I've done some example readings of this on the channel and this spread is pretty simple. The way that I like to do card of the year is to just choose a card randomly from the majors. Um, you could also choose a card of the year yourself, like decide what you want to focus on this year or how you think your year is going to potentially go. You know, like I feel like, oh, it's feeling, it's feeling kind of chaotic and maybe it's going to be a wheel of fortune year or I'm trying to start a new project, this a big new project this year, so I'll choose the Empress or something like that. You pick your card of the year and then you just look at um, four questions around that central card. So you put that card down and then you can look at what aspect of the card of the year is most important, how you can apply that energy to your endeavors or your plans or your ideas for the year, what obstacle is likely to arise around this card of the year, this, this theme, and then advice to face that obstacle or that challenge. So it's, it's an interesting reading and one that's fairly open-ended and you can kind of keep coming back to as the year progresses. Um, another spread that I really like that I believe comes from Kelly of A Truth and Story. I found out about it from Sylvain and I did a um, sample reading of it on my channel, but just to refresh your memory, it is the nine card it's kind of a blend of an elemental spread with a French cross. And this is a good one to pull out at fairs and festivals. It's easy to memorize. Um, it's less kind of complicated than the Celtic cross. Still gives you a nice pile of cards to work with. And you can start to look at repeating patterns and how things reflect back on each other or visual rhymes or things. Um, and also place it, placement of elements. So, you know, here I would say, okay, we have an earth card in the fire position. We have the star card in the water position and I can't remember what element is supposedly assigned to the star card but that's kind of interesting stars reflecting off water um, here we have another earth card in the air position and then the devil in the earth position so what does that mean um, it just gives you a little bit more information to read from so that is the elemental cross or that nine card spread, I think, is what Sylvain dubbed it. But yeah, that's a fun one to do. 
And then the third spread I just want to mention um, based on a reading that I got from a friend who has the Hoodoo Tarot, and she did a reading for me called The Right Doc Spread out of that book. And I can't tell you a lot about it because it is really the work of the author of that deck. But the, the aim of this is very specific, and it's to look at whether a specific teacher or mentor or guru or spiritual leader or whatever you want to call them um, is a good fit for you. So if you were thinking of, you know, looking for a faculty advisor for your PhD, or you're looking to join a new spiritual group or congregation and you're looking at the head of that organization um, or the or the main spiritual leader priest or whoever they are so um, i thought that was incredible and it was the reading was very helpful for me um, and so i'm thinking of picking up a copy of that deck just to see what other spreads are in that book the hoodoo tarot it's mass market and it comes with the big book with all the spreads the next prompt is two tarot essentials or tarot accessories or things like that. And my two essentials are a spread cloth. Um, the one we're looking at right now is one that I made myself using a process called eco printing, where you can treat fabric um, with certain chemicals and then you can press organic matter into that and uh, sort of steep it and extract color. Um, and it makes an interesting pattern. I always have a spread cloth. I have some some others. I have the one that goes with the Fit the Spirit Tarot, which is really cool because it has a lot of these um, symbols on it and it looks very sort of witchy and Halloween and whatever. Um, I also have this one, uh, which Brant of the Moon Baby Tarot and Ch Channel made for me a while back. It's beautifully um, tie-dyed. It is uh, reversible. You can see it's like double double-sided. Um, with two different color palettes, and I just love this one. You've seen it on my channel a lot in the early days, and then I decided to switch it up, but I absolutely love this cloth. Yeah, and I think it's just nice, even even if it's a desk that you um, typically work at without you know, having food and drink, and it keeps, keeps pretty tidy. Um, I still like it because it prevents cards from sliding all over the place. Um, and certainly when I'm on a trip or I'm reading somewhere, it's really nice to put down a spread cloth on top of, you know, a sticky cafe table or, you know, a park bench or whatever, and just protect your cards that way. So uh, having a spread cloth is very essential. And then the other one would be a notebook to keep track of readings. So um, I always try to keep track of my readings. I can't say I'm 100% I'm there, but I'm certainly 90% there. If I'm reading for a friend, and here's an example. Uh, I have this particular notebook. So I have just this fun little um, notebook like that. It's soft and flexible, and it's what I keep all my friends' readings in. So I'll, I'll note the date and their, um, you know, their name and what uh, deck I was reading with and the time, and then what they got, what their question was, what they got, and then sort of some notes on, on my interpretation at the time. Now my interpretation might change a little bit if I go back and review this later, or even if they go back and review it later, they might have some other insights. But just to make some notes of, of what I thought during the reading, um, I like to, to do that and keep track and then, you know, potentially check in with them and say, hey, did that, you know, did that reading from last year, how did that turn out? How did that situation change for you? Did you make any progress on that? Uh, or did your attitude towards that change based on the reading, that kind of thing. Um, if I'm receiving a reading, either one that I'm doing for myself or that a friend has done, I'll do something similar, but I do always print the cards as well because generally when friends read with me, they're reading from decks that I don't have a copy of. So um, here's one example. And again, I'll write down what, what deck it was. So this is the Duffomatic deck and um, then I'll, you know, note my question. Um, I'll kind of note their comments and I'll, I'll ask them to send me a picture of the card so that I can print this out and paste it in. And then I'll look back on it usually, you know, a day or two later and kind of reflect and add my own thoughts as well. And then go forward in time and come back and look at it maybe after the event or as things have matured a little bit with the situation and you know sort of reflect on what the information was and how it applied just a pretty cool way to get something more out of your reading than the direct experience of doing it in the moment um, as to having having that ability to reflect back on it and see you know what ended up being the truth about the matter and the actual outcome or even looking and seeing like okay how did this change my attitude and then what were the things that maybe I did differently or said differently or thought about differently that helped me move forward. 
And so the last prompt is one of two options. You can either talk about a specific tarot card or you can give advice. And me being the opinionated person that I am, I'm going to give you some advice, uh, which I've given on this channel before in some ways. But I want to I want to call this piece of advice. Don't get locked in. And I mean it in two aspects. Um, one is don't get locked in to tarot card meanings or definitions. Um, if you read something like Eden Gray or A.E. Waite or Crowley or whatever, they're going to be very specific and they're going to be very heavy handed in terms of what is the meaning of this card? The meaning of the star card is hope, inspiration, and health. Okay. Or could it be about like being naked or could it be about being a star or could it be about playing in the water or could it be about staring at yourself in a pool or could it be about hanging out under a night sky or could it be about something else? You know, you're, you're, you're locking me into this thing. And that's what most tarot guidebooks are like. Um, it's certainly historically what most tarot writers are like, especially all these esoteric dudes that wanted to to talk about tarot as some secret formula, formula to the secret of life and all you have to do is memorize all these meanings and then you will know the secrets and then blah 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 blah. Um, I think that makes for terrible and inaccessible tarot readings myself. So don't get locked into definitions like this kind of a book. Yes, everyone does need to start somewhere, but the sooner you can get away from this, you can sort of appreciate the structure behind a tarot deck and that the fact that the cards are numbered and that there's repeating numbers and there's suits and, and, and court cards and things like there's four queens and four kings. So that has some significance. But as soon as you can get away from this kind of thing and be a little bit more open and situational and, you know, read all the tarot books, even the bad ones, because um, sometimes you get really interesting ideas from those kind of expand your horizons in terms of looking at a tarot reading as an experience and not about regurgitating definitions. I think that's really enriching and fulfilling and that's what brings me back to the tarot over and over again as a tool. The other piece of tarot advice I have is don't get locked in if you are a content creator. Don't get locked into what other people are doing. Yes, there are popular, uh, if we take YouTube, for example, there are very popular kinds of activities to do on one's YouTube channel. For example, tag responses, okay? Um, but do I have to do this tag response? No. Do I have to do every tag response? No. I'm doing this one because I want to, but in general, I don't do a ton of them. Same thing for walkthroughs or reviews. You know, if you want to review decks, if you enjoy doing that, if you can do it in a way that actually provides some kind of information to your audience rather than just ooing and gnawing and going, oh my god, this is so beautiful, and this one's so beautiful, and this one's so beautiful. Um, buy all the decks, spend all the money. Um, you know, if you can do that in a slightly less consumerist way and a little bit more um, thoughtful, I think that's very helpful. And I've certainly done my own walkthroughs and reviews. Um, I started doing comparative walkthroughs because I was really interested in seeing not just different tarot decks, but how different artists work around a theme or how different decks from a similar time period look different or how tarot decks over time seem to change in a certain direction. So, and then you have people with all different kinds of content. Um, and just to name a few examples, you know, Simon of the Hermit's Cave, um, he does a ton of walkthroughs, but he also does interviews and he does casual chats about specific topics. Uh, Will of Atypical Tarot does these really cool videos where he looks at a specific tarot card and then he talks about its alchemical properties and its equivalent in terms of a, a crystal kind of energy. And that also lets him talk about things like inventions and scientific discoveries over time. So that's really cool. But uh, Laura of Aquamarine 18 Tarot and Books um, talks about books and she talks about tarot books, but she also talks about other kinds of books. Um, and it's just really interesting. If you like her content in general, then you find out about her taste in books and certainly my reading list has expanded. Same thing with Kelly Bear, the uh, instigator of this tag. You know, she does a lot of reviews of tarot and esoteric and um, pagan witchcraft kind of books. So it's like tarot adjacent, but it's not just tarot content. So I encourage you, um, you know, if you want to do reviews and tags and call it a day, great, that's your channel. Um, but think about what you could do that sets you apart and something that really appeals to you. Um, not necessarily what's going to be the most popular because I would say 99.9% .9 of tarot channels out there are not trying to make a living off of doing tarot videos. 
Um, it's very difficult, I think, to, to make a living off of doing videos in the tarot realm. So really, we're all just here for fun and to explore and learn together. And if you can do that in such a way that you, you know, maybe you're talking about your reading style or your practice or some interesting readings that you've done for friends or, you know, anything along those lines, different techniques. I love Tom Benjamin's channel when he talks about different spreads or different techniques for reading tarot that he's played around with. Um, that He was another one who was very instrumental in my, um, especially my very early days, kind of learning and, and learning to read. So, you know, anything that's, that's a little bit different or that goes into a deeper exploration rather than just the, the consumer side, um, I think is engaging and interesting. And I think it will keep people coming back to your channel. And I can say that from experience because, you know, even though I haven't been meeting a lot of steady content over the past few months, I've just been very busy, but you guys have been great about, you know, still leaving comments and still watching my videos and even doing deep dives and going back on my channel and, and watching older videos and older comparisons. Um, it's been really awesome. So I want to thank my audience, but I also want to kind of encourage you if you're, if you have a channel and you've either run out of ideas or you don't know what to do next, um, just to think about something that you're interested in. Um, not what's popular again, but just what's, what are you interested in and what can you demonstrate or show us or explore together that might be interesting to your audience. I think that's a great way to not get locked into some sort of formulaic thing, but to, to make your channel and your content your own. So um, with that, I will wrap up and just say thank you again for watching and thanks to Kelly Bear for initiating this tag and to everyone who's done the tag. Um, I do hope to um, get caught up and watch all of those over the next couple of weeks. I think there's quite a few of them, but I think this was a fun one and again allows us to explore our own insights and preferences and the tools that have helped us um, the tools that support us, like specific spreads or books that we found uh, useful over time. So again, very cool tag, and thank you to Kelly there, and thanks to all of you, and I'll see you all very soon. Take care, and bye-bye.